Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, editor-at-large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. Wyoming is the 10th largest state in the nation by area, but it's the smallest in the nation when it comes to population. Its entire population is just about 579,000 people. Wyoming has had 495 confirmed COVID cases as of today, with 158 more that are probable, and seven deaths. It's done about 13,500 tests in the state, so it's a big state with a small population, but those numbers are impressive when compared even to other rural communities around the country. The state's governor, Mark Gordon, opened some businesses on May 1st, including gyms, barbershops, salons, and tattoo parlors. He is planning to reopen bars and restaurants on May 15th if the establishments put in place certain precautions. Tensions are high, though, around the nation on when to reopen, how to reopen, how to embed new safety protocols for customers and workers, and what the social contract of rights and responsibilities between an employer and workers ought to be in this period. All of these debates are taking place inside states, inside the White House, and in the Congress. There are debates as well as how to spend more money, uh, if any, and how much ought to go to states and localities who are seeing their tax revenues collapse. To discuss whether Wyoming's example and COVID experience can be useful to others, and to discuss the tug of war over how and when to open, my next guest is Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming. Senator Barrasso also happens to be an orthopedic surgeon and has worked to assure financial support for struggling rural hospitals and health centers. He's the third ranking member in the Senate Republican leadership, chairing the Republican conference, and he chairs the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Welcome, Senator John Barrasso. John, thanks so much for doing this with me today. I wanted to get um, a snapshot of the fact that Wyoming is one of those states that's ahead of most. I mean, you've, you've lowered the curve in terms of the incidence of COVID and you've been a proponent of opening. And I'm interested in what lessons can we take from how Wyoming is doing this now? Well, thanks so much, Steve. You know, we always say in Wyoming, we've been socially distancing for the whole 130 years of statehood <laughs> because there are only about five people per square mile. But people like to get together. Uh, you know, church is a big thing every Sunday, rodeos, fairs, activities that people are still looking forward to doing this summer. But we did socially distance. The state never really completely shut down. We just uh, allowed for people in Wyoming to use their good common sense uh, to try to do what we could to prevent uh, the disease and the, and the spread of the disease. And early on, the, the hot spot was uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, because of travelers coming from other places. They really did shut down quite a bit there. But the surprise to all of us was the it was a nursing home in Lander, Wyoming, a fairly mm. small community, which was the first to be hardest hit. And that let people realize this can happen anywhere, doesn't necessarily happen to the big cities. I mean, people saw on television what was happening uh, in New York, but what we saw at Lander, Wyoming, if Lander, Wyoming can be hit, anybody can. Let's take this seriously. And I think it mattered uh, in terms of being able to keep our numbers way down. We, we've seen in a lot of places in the country that the divide between those who want to open more quickly, those who said we've got to get the public safety equities in place first, um, it's almost become a partisan divide again. And I'm interested in whether that's happened in your state at all, or is there a greater consensus that the opening and the way it's happening right now uh, is, in, is moving in the right direction? Well, we think we're moving in the right direction. We want to do it smartly. We want to do it safely. Uh, that's what the governor, and that's what all the folks in the state have continued to, to say. There have been uh, some uh, level of protests of people saying, hey, I've, this has affected my life and my livelihood. I don't want to give up my liberties uh, as well, because every everybody in America has been impacted with coronavirus one way or the other. Some people from the health standpoint has been dramatically worse than the economic standpoint. But in Wyoming, it's the economic side of it that hit us the hardest. We went flatline in terms of energy, in terms of agriculture, in terms of tourism. You know, four million people a year come to Yellowstone National Park. It is one of the great sites of the world. Well, we're not going to have that this summer uh, for sure. Lots of those are always uh, international travelers. So we're impacted economically more than from the disease standpoint. So people want to get the economy moving, going again. And uh, people, I think, have been very responsible in, in the way we've done it in Wyoming. Early on, I was talking regularly to our hospital administrator at the Wyoming Medical Center, where I was the chief of staff. They have 18 respirators. I uh, talked to the head of uh, pulmonary disease on Friday, and they have a total of two people on respirators. So because of the things that we've done, they were worried there wouldn't be enough. 
And now we're finding that we've had more than enough and uh, we've never used that many in the entire time I was practicing medicine and as, uh, as the chief of staff of the hospital. Senator, on uh, Friday, I interviewed uh, Congressman Will Hurd down in Texas, and, and he made this very interesting comment that down there, they happen to have a testing facility, they, got, they have a surplus of kits, and their problem is people aren't showing up to get the tests. And so he said it's very uneven around the country. There's been a big debate about you know, how to roll out testing, how to make it sort of omnipresent, if you will. And I saw Mark Gordon, your governor, actually telling people, hey, if you feel ill, if you have something going, go in and get a test. Is there some reluctance out there? Because this is a part of the testing drama I haven't seen covered much, is that people don't want to get tests. Well, the, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. The idea was you had to be symptomatic to get the tests. Uh, the, the doctors who were sending patients for tests were ones that were expected to be positive tests. But you're, again, you're right. You're talking about the number of tests we're doing now, 300 a day, and yet only five or six are positive. So the percentage of those even of suspected people are still a small, small percentage of those are testing positive. Uh, the public, general public hasn't been encouraged to get tested this time. We were, we're holding tests back for uh, frontline healthcare workers, as, as well as patients who are showing the symptoms. And, you know, if you have a fever, they would take your temperature before they take the, give you the test. Do you have any respiratory symptoms? All of those issues that we know are the potential signs of coronavirus. But today there's a, a national story on the, so many different ways coronavirus may present in terms of the symptoms. Now we're saying maybe you don't have to have a fever. There's respiratory signs, yes, gastrointestinal issues related to its circulatory components. There is so much, and I'm a doctor, I, I've been studying this. I've been go, I went to every briefing starting back in January. During the impeachment, Steve, we were having bipartisan Senate briefings in the morning before we'd go to impeachment in the afternoon. Mm. You have a number of us in the Senate who've been following this very closely, reading everything we can, studying all we can about this topic, and there is still a great deal we do not know. Do you, you're a, you're a doctor, so you have a respect for science in, in what you've built, but do you have a worry that as we approach drug development, vaccine development, you know, the, the drama about hydroxychloroquine and whatnot, that we are not giving science the right time to play out because of the urgency of this? Well, there is an urgency, and to play out the science of it requires, uh, if you talk about, talk to Dr. Fauci and his long history, uh, with, uh, with with his scientific background, you know, he wants to double blind studies and give people the placebos and find enough of a test. The uh, There is an urgency in lives matter and time matters, which is why we're saying if there's potential to have a vaccine that may work, if there are five different vaccines, make all of them realizing that there's only one that's going to be the best, that's the one you're going to use. So there's going to be some waste in that in that process. The same with medicines. I mean, there was an article two months ago about different things that might work. I've read this actually in The Economist, the British magazine, mm -hmm. and hydroxychloroquine was one of those that was listed, as was medicine for AIDS, as was medicine for hepatitis, as was medicine for, for, for SARS and for uh, the you know, different components of Ebola. So there were thoughts that let's try a lot of things and see what becomes the most likely. And now we have one product that seems not to be a home run, not to be the silver bullet, but to at least be a good step in the treatment. The same thing that's happening that's, with- that, the vaccine, that is uh, remdesivir, I just wanted remdesivir. to get. With the vaccine, you know, the routine way scientifically of trying a vaccine out is you come up with something that's safe, you give it to a lot of people and let them go back to their normal lives and see how many people get the disease, whatever it is. Well, now they're saying, let's not try to do that with coronavirus. Let's do challenge tests where you get a number of volunteers, pay them, give them the vaccine once you find one that you believe is safe, and then expose them directly to coronavirus. Well, that's a riskier proposition, but you're going to know pretty soon if everybody that's had this vaccine, if none of them get the coronavirus after they've been exposed, or what if all of them get it? That means that vaccine hasn't hasn't worked. So you're taking risks with human lives to get effective vaccines or treatments sooner. 
You were part of the team that helped sculpt the CARE package, a bipartisan piece of legislation, provided trillions of dollars uh, to the economy. I'm interested as you look back at it now, maybe it's too early to look at that, but what did you folks get wrong when you look at that? Well, you know, this was done in a bipartisan way, passed the Senate 96 uh, to nothing. There are things that we got right, which could have done even better. And I think about these uh, small business loans that have gone out, uh, the paycheck protection that uh, has gone out around the country. Uh, in, in Wyoming, we've had over a billion dollars, over 11,000 of these loans, stories every day, and people that say this made a big difference for them. But you hear stories about how what the Los Angeles Lakers have got one of these loans or businesses that probably shouldn't have. And in an effort to get the money out to people immediately, uh, there were ways it could have been done better. And some of the regulations that the, the SBA wrote uh, weren't part of the original uh, law itself, but the way it's being implemented, I don't think was in the intention in that what 75% of the money had to be used for salaries. Well, every business doesn't, doesn't fit that, that model but you wanna keep people on the payroll and that's the goal of it. And we've accomplished that um, significantly. Would have been better to have had a little more time if you knew that this was gonna be done this way, that would have, you would have changed it a bit. What, what are, are you gonna be part of another um, package? Do you think there's more out there that needs to be done or do you think you need to take a break? Well, I think we don't know yet what needs to be done additionally. We wanna see where we are, we spent you know up to three trillion dollars added. This is all borrowed money. You want to make sure it's being used wisely. You know, as a doctor in an estate with lots of small hospitals which operate on very thin margins. Uh, you know, a lot of my focus has been on rural hospitals. In most communities, that rural hospital is not just the, me the medical mecca for the community; it's also the, the economic center. And if, if a hospital closes, and about 200 hospitals have closed. In the, in the United States over the last seven or eight years, they're all small hospitals. And if that hospital closes in a rural community, it's harder for that community to attract teachers, nurses, doctors, small businesses. Uh, it's, it's a really bad situation for the, that community. So what we've been doing is working with the, uh, the administration and bipartisan ways to help hospitals those that have huge needs like those in New York where they've been treating lots of patients and those in rural communities where they've been essentially shut down to preserve the personal protective equipment, haven't done any elective procedures. And somebody said, well, what do you need for an elective procedure? Well, mammograms are an elective procedure. Mm -hmm. My wife is a breast cancer survivor. So it's not just somebody that wants to you know, get a total hip replacement. There are a lot of routine medical things, colonoscopies, all of those things have been canceled, which are preventative and are necessary for patients. So what we've been doing, in, um, as you talked about the, the CARES Act, we've done another piece of legislation, another, what, $650 uh, billion recently with additional money onto the Paycheck Protection, but also another $75 billion for hospitals. None of that money has been sent out yet. So wow. we don't know how much is necessary out there. The money to states, 150 billion has been sent to states. Uh, very little of that has been actually spent so far. I think states should have more flexibility with how they use that 150 billion that they have, but I don't know that they'll need additional amounts, although the Speaker of the House is asking for it right now. John, I mean, just in final, in our final moments here, I'd, I'd like to get your sense of just, just looking back. When you look at the footprint of COVID in the United States right now, it's, it's staggeringly large. And you compare that to where this came from, even China. Uh, you look at some of the neighboring countries like Japan and, and South Korea. We see New Zealand has basically uh, wiped this out. I'm just interested, do, do we all have to kind of go back and get an accounting somehow of why this was able to spread in the United States to the you know, incredible degree. What did we get wrong from your perspective as you talk to your colleagues you know, behind the scenes? Where did we screw up? Well, n number one is there's gonna be plenty of time to look around and point around. And I would expect that the entire presidential campaign of 2020, Steve, is gonna involve some finger pointing. The, I don't think that solves the problem today. We need a vaccine, we need treatment. We need more testing. We have about 2 million tests a week right now. Uh, Dr. Fauci says we need 3 million. There's a he hearing 
on the Hill this week uh, with Lamar Alexander's help committee, and they'll have the panel of experts. Testing will be a big part of that discussion. When can more and more people get tested? What do we need to have in place so schools can open again in the fall? So, yeah, there's going to be a number of things. You know, I think the Washington Post did a story about the Center for Disease Control and the original round of tests, which the Center for Disease Control violated their own procedures, which resulted, I believe, in about a five-week delay of, of advanced testing uh, to the point where we're, running, we're still about five weeks behind where I would like us to be, but we're going to be we're capable of doing two million tests a week, which moves it from just the symptomatic people that you and I were talking about earlier to much more broad uh, testing in society and more frequent. Ultimately, we need to get to the point where you can test for the immunoglobulins to say if, if not just do you have the, the, the coronavirus right now that you're a carrier, but also mm. are you in some way uh, immune? They talk about an immunity passport for some people that, that have the immunoglobulins build up. And uh, how long is that going to last for? We, we know if you've had the measles, you, you know, you're protected for the rest of your life. We know you have the flu, you might get it again next year. So there are, there are different things that we need to learn, and we're still learning a lot about a disease that is uh, caught the world by surprise uh, and has impacted everyone in one way or the other. Well, when this is all over and the clouds dissipate a bit, I want to get out to Wyoming and go to rodeo with you, and I want to go to the gym. There are no gyms open anywhere around here, and I'm so jealous that you have. That could be a good tourist destination to go to Wyoming for open gyms. Well, uh, Senator John Barrasso, thank you so much for your insights and for joining us today. Uh, and thank you all for joining me today. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.